Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Richard Masterson was born on March 5, 1972 in Texas. He had at least one brother and one sister, and his sister said that life was rough for Richard growing up. He had a hard time because their father would assault him on a regular basis. He was not interested in school and ended up dropping out after grade six. As he got older, he acquired odd jobs as a welder, carpenter, and a laborer, but for him, crime was where it was at in order to make quick cash. When Richard turned 19, he made his way to Walker County, Georgia to commit a crime. He was arrested for burglary and was sentenced to four-year adult probation, but his sentence was later revoked to one-year time served. Richard ended up spending time at the Tennessee Department of Corrections, Brushy Mountain Correctional Complex, Georgia Department of Corrections, Bostick Correctional Institute, and other locations as well. While serving time in Georgia, he was transferred to Texas to serve a two-year sentence for a burglary of a building committed in 1989. He was released on parole in Harris County on October 19, 1992. His parole discharge date was on September 29, 1994. In 1999, Richard stayed in Michigan for a while and he began dating a woman named Deidre Foster. One day, Deidre received a call from someone she did not know, but Richard got extremely jealous. He ripped the phone out of the wall and assaulted her with it. He threatened her if she called the police, but she was able to lock herself in the room to call the police anyway. The locked door did nothing to hold Richard back because he was able to break the door, get inside of her room, and assault her even more. Police arrived just in time to save her because Richard said that he would have killed her if they did not show up. Richard was locked up for a short while and Deidre moved to South Carolina but never truly felt safe after what Richard did to her, so she constantly moved to new areas. Her worst nightmares came true in April of 2000 when Richard found out where Deidre lived. He casually walked into her house and said, I found you. Deidre was able to survive that day without being assaulted, but she moved to Houston, Texas from South Carolina, thinking she would be safe, but Richard found her again. Fast forward to February 9, 2001, Richard, who was a closeted gay man, decided to go to a bar in Houston, Texas. He met a man named Darren, who also happened to be a drag queen, who went by the name of Brandy Houston. Richard and Darren were sexually attracted to each other, so they agreed to leave the bar together and head to Darren's apartment so they could hook up. After having intercourse, Richard put Darren in a headlock and killed him. After killing Darren, Richard then ransacked the apartment and stole whatever he could get his hands on. When he escaped, he took off in Darren's vehicle. The next day, of course Darren did not show up for work but this concerned one of his friends. The friend was worried enough to head over to Darren's apartment complex and was able to speak with the manager and explain to him that it was not normal for Darren to not reach out to anyone the whole day. He finally convinced the apartment manager to open Darren's front door and that is when they discovered Darren's dead body. As for Richard, he drove Darren's car all the way to Georgia and left the car with some of his relatives. He then started driving another vehicle all the way to Florida. Richard was not remorseful for what he did and even told a few people he had killed someone. Everyone he told initially kept quiet. While heading to Florida, Richard's nephew was arrested for possession of cocaine that he had in Darren's vehicle. Richard's brother James was not able to hold his brother's secret in for long. He ended up reaching out to the Houston Homicide Department and he was put in touch with Sergeant R. Parrish. James told Sergeant Parrish that his brother was the one that wanted him to contact police in order to clear up the cause of Darren's death. Police were suspecting that Darren died of a heart attack, but James said Richard wanted them to know that the cause of death was BS, and he put Darren down. James then explained that Richard had Darren in a headlock until he went limp. It was now February 3rd, eight days after Darren died, and Richard was now in Tampa, Florida, not in police custody. He went to a gay nightclub in Tampa and met another man by the name of Stephen Drew. Richard and Stephen agreed to hook up, so the two left the bar together. Richard tagged along with Drew in his car as they drove to his apartment. Once inside of the apartment, Richard put Drew in a headlock until he lost consciousness. With Drew out of the way, 
Richard then stole his wallet and keys and then drove off in his car. When Drew finally became conscious again, he called the police and told them that he was assaulted and that his car was stolen. Richard was able to evade arrest for three whole days, and he was finally caught after an officer was able to identify the stolen vehicle he was driving that belonged to Drew. While in jail, a Houston police officer by the name of David Knoll took a trip to Florida in order to interview Richard at the Marion County Jail. Richard hid nothing from Officer Knoll and admitted that he intentionally killed Darren so that he could rob him. He also admitted to assaulting Drew. Lastly, he admitted that the drugs that were found in Darren's car that his cousin got busted for actually belonged to him. Richard was charged for murder, and when trial began, his lawyers did not want him to testify. Richard went against his lawyer's wishes and testified anyway. Richard changed his story when he took to the stand, and he told the court that he and Darren had consensual sex, and Darren requested that Richard put him in a sleeper hold in order to enhance the sexual experience. He said that he was used to performing the move on others before, but still felt uncomfortable at first and initially refused to do the move. He said the move scared him, but he ended up doing what Darren wanted, and Darren just so happened to die. He then said the only reason he fled the scene was because he had convictions on his record, and he only stole Darren's car and possessions to make it look like a robbery. The last victim Richard assaulted, Stephen Drew, took to the stand. He was quoted saying, There was nothing sexual about it. It was really violent, and I knew it had nothing to do with sex at all. The medical examiner also testified. He told the court that Darren had a narrowed coronary artery, which could have sped up his death, but it wasn't the cause of his death. The official cause of death was external neck compression. The jurors were then told that they were able to find Richard guilty of manslaughter only if they believed Darren's death was unintentional. When the jury deliberated, they did not think Darren's death was unintentional, and in April of 2002, the jury came back with a unanimous decision of finding Richard guilty of capital murder. As many of you may or may not know, in the state of Texas, if someone is found guilty of capital murder and the state seeks the death penalty, the jury must answer two questions. Will the defendant be a future danger to society? And were there any mitigating circumstances that would warrant a lesser sentence of life in prison? The jury did not have to listen and rely on closing arguments from Richard's lawyers bringing up good behavior in jail or closing arguments from the state because Richard took to the stand and told them everything they needed to know himself. During the punishment hearing, Richard chose to stay in his orange jail jumpsuit, even though he had the option of changing into something more presentable, and he told the jury that he was a future danger to society and there were no mitigating circumstances. He urged the jury to sentence him to death if they were following the law. He then proceeded to say that he would definitely hurt an inmate or guard if he had to protect himself or his property. He was quoted saying, If that arises, yes I will. I'm sure within 40 years, it will arise sometimes. You're positive there's no way you could stay in prison probably even for a year without getting violent again, right? Richard replied, Probably not. Probably not even a month. Deputy Yurik took to the stand to testify about Richard's behavior. He said that one time he spoke with Richard in jail about cleaning up after himself and not getting his food trays when he was done. Richard responded by telling him he would hurt him just like he hurt his victims. The court was also made aware of past events in which he assaulted and injured his cellmates when he was locked up in Michigan and Houston. Richard spoke out. Most of the time they deserved it. Richard's ex-girlfriend Deidre also testified about their past and Richard said that everything she said was true. After hearing everything, the jury unanimously voted that Richard be sentenced to death. Richard was sent to Huntsville State Penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals confirmed the conviction and sentence in 2005. Over the years, Richard tried to appeal his case despite asking for the death penalty. In the appeals, Richard and his team tried claiming that Darren's death was accidental and his confession was coerced. They claimed that Richard was depressed and he was not advised of his rights in a proper manner. They believed that Darren died of a heart attack. It seemed, however, that Richard truly was not on the same page as his lawyers and they filed appeals against his wishes because in 2012, he wrote a letter to his attorneys and some of the text that was in the letter read, I meant to kill him, and it was no accident. All of Richard's appeals were denied and his execution date was scheduled for January 20th, 2016. Richard agreed to an interview with the Houston Chronicle before his execution and his story changed yet again because he told the interviewer, 
I never admitted I murdered anybody, but I do accept responsibility. He also said the upcoming execution would set him free. Free him from hell. It was now his execution day, and before being executed, he said his final words. He said he was okay with what was going to happen. Sometimes you have to live and die by the choices you make. I made mine, and I'm paying for it. I'm going to be sent to a better place. He then made a kiss face for his friends and relatives that were in attendance of the execution. He told them he loved them and let the warden know he was ready to go. Richard was pronounced dead at 6.53 p.m. Thank you everyone for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below.